All right, welcome back. Um, let's start by starting the same way as usual, me asking you what you remember from the last lecture. Again, raise your hand right in the chat or anything like this. What did we talk about? Is there anything that you remember? Decision trees is something that we talked about, yeah. I tried to demo something. My computer was a bit slow for that. Anything else? Kind of lack of specifications, yeah. Um, we repeated this, talked about this a little bit more, that we don't have them separating uh, training and test data and also validation data. We actually talked about three steps, right, that you often need to do when you do hyperparameter tuning, um, overfitting, underfitting, right? Yeah, so overall, I think I, I tried to do kind of an introduction to machine learning that at least we have kind of a similar baseline and have an idea of concepts like parameter, hyperparameters, um, overfitting, and how this actually works so that we can evaluate if we put this into a system, what we might expect and what we might not find. Um, so there were a couple of things that I didn't quite get to last time that I wanna catch up on. And I suspect I also run out of time today, but I want to continue on this path of kind of basics of machine learning um, I want to talk about deep neural networks and then hopefully I get a little bit of time to talk about um, some maybe slightly less popular techniques, more symbolic AI techniques, just to kind of round up that we're not just talking about machine learning, but also about the larger picture and when you would use this. Um, one thing that I want to start with is that um, last time we talked a lot about kind of building the models, learning the models. Um, one thing that's important is that um, people tend to think of machine learning as pipelines. And that's actually something that we'll talk more about later that um, machine learning is not about just building the model, but having an entire process to reproduce the model. Um, and we focus a lot on quality assurance of this process and making it repeatable and so on later. This is one of many different forms of showing this, uh, but they are all kind of similar where you think of the pipeline or of the, yeah, of the pipeline to learn a machine learning model of as multiple stages. This is fairly common um, where maybe you focus on, think about kind of what the goals or the requirements are initially. Then there's a lot of work in data collection and data cleaning, data labeling feature engineering, model training, model evaluation. And if you're lucky, somebody puts this into production and then you have some deployment and some mon monitoring later. Um, I suspect a bunch of these stages are kind of self-explanatory, so, but let's think of, again about this problem that we talked about last time that you want to predict the sales prices of houses, right? So that's kind of the goal. So the first step is just figuring out what do we want to do? Yeah, kind of figuring out how much might a house be worth when we're selling it. And then let's assume we are still using um, supervised machine learning, right? Then we, uh, then we need some way of training the model. We want to learn this prediction function F here, and we need to find a way to gather data that we can train it on. In practice, there's a lot of effort in this part and a lot of creativity potentially, or you might even just start thinking about a certain model when you have the right data that you can even start thinking about this. Um, data gathering, if you, if you do kind of a machine learning course, it's often just somebody gives you a file that's already prepared, but in practice there's often a lot of effort where you might scrape some data from the internet, where you have to negotiate with somebody to give you data, maybe um, have it in a certain format and so on. And so there might be quite a bit of data. Um, what kind of data do you think we could use to train a model like this um, to predict housing prices, let's say in Pittsburgh? If we wanted to build something like this, um, how would you approach data collection? What kind of data might be available? And again, write in the chat or, or raise your hand, Leo. So there are a bunch of uh, housing trading website like Zillow, things like that. And they have a recent history of 
where the real estate are and um, how much they were sold or right. you can scrap from those kind of website to get yep. some sort of data. That's, that's probably illegal, but that's one way of getting data. So you're probably violating their terms of service, um, which may or may not be okay, depending on your business model and your agreement. Um, but this, this is one way, right? Property tax records is something that Jake said, right? Is something um, actually all the sales in the US are public, um, right? So ever, whenever a title is transferred, there's a public sale. Um, they're typically not on the internet automatically or depends on the, the county, I think. Um, uh, there used to be a big business um, of people going to the office every day to look at the books or the paperwork that they have, which is public information, um, and then kind of scrape this and sell this to a bunch of companies that send you spam afterwards or something like this. Uh, so when you buy a house, you get overwhelmed with kind of spam afterwards, um, which is because this is all public records and they have your address, obviously, may, may probably your name, and even how much the house was worth and even uh, which company your mortgage comes from. And so this is public information. So this is stuff that you could gather from the internet. Um, and in addition, there's probably more information that you can collect, right? So this will give you some information about the house, but not much more than the address and the sales price. It doesn't really tell you how big the house is, probably, um, which you might get from some listings. Maybe some of those are easy to scrape, right? But you can also think about things like what do we know about the neighborhood that the house is in? Right? So again, there are different public records. So maybe you can look at the crime rate um, that might be listed on the city website and correlate this with the zip code. Um, right? There might be other information, uh, maybe about school districts, uh, things like this. Um, and you might actually collect data from multiple different sources and aggregate this. Right? So this is very common. In the end, you want one table, but often this comes from many different sources and is often not directly in the format that you want it eventually. Um, next step, you do some sort of data cleaning. Um, what kind of cleaning might be needed? What can you think of in this specific example? Um, what kind of cleaning might you need? There might be missing data. You might be able to fill that in, right? Removing of outliers might be um, a good idea, right? So um, there might just be implausible values that something says you have 200 rooms in a house, right? Um, this might just be noisy data that you can remove. Um, um, uh, mm. So data format would be checking. There might be strong valid, uh, violations of the format that you might be able to deal with, um, right? And it might come from different sources. Maybe you need to translate them. That could be part of cleaning, but I think it's usually part of collection. Um, but yeah, so, so typical things are removing outliers, filling in missing data, things like this. Data labeling is figuring out what the supposed outcome would be. In this specific example, we already looked uh, for kind of sales records, right? This is where we would get labels from. Uh, we could also take some data and ask experts to do this, or we could use like the Zillow algorithm or something like this, like a reference model that gives us some labels that we could use. Um, and then there's feature engineering, right? Feature engineering is now you have a lot of kind of raw data from different sources and you want to figure out what are the features that you're training on. And the features are the inputs to these functions, uh, to this function here, right? So you want to figure out, um, A, what features do you want? And then you need to extract them, right? So you need to figure out how can I figure out how many um, rooms this has, how many square meter or square feet, um, what the tax is, what the neighborhood is like, the crime rate, things like this for this specific, for each row in your data set, right? So you're kind of curating the table that you can learn on. Um, and model training is in, in a lot of places, just these two lines of code, sometimes more where you actually learn, uh, apply a learning function, right? Uh, call, a, call a framework to, to train your code. 
um, model evaluation is what we talked about last time as well, kind of computing accuracy on some test or validation set. All right, and then you push it into production into monitoring. In practice, what most, most courses talk about most of the time is kind of model training. Like how does it actually work? How do the different kind of models work? And maybe feature engineering. Um, like how can I extract interesting things out of the data? What are the things that I'm learning on? In practice, it seems that data scientists actually spend most of their time in kind of data collection and data cleaning phases. Like um, thinking about what kind of data can we get? Is this sufficient? How can we prepare the data? Um, and labeling is also very expensive. Um, kind of the initial requirements and the deployments and the monitoring that's more in a software engineering realm typically. Um, this is not um, at least what a data science course would typically focus much on. Um, let's see, which is I think also what I, I kind of try to explain here. This is what just what we talked about. There are lots of challenges, but they are kind of in the data science oh, oh, there are lots out there, but I don't want to go too much into this. Um, maybe the, the one part that I want to kind of emphasize again is that it's a good practice if you're building a system with a machine learning component to not just think about, oh, somebody has built me a model and here I have the model, right? So some sort of function, but you actually want to have a process to produce this model. So you really want to think in terms of pipelines, think in terms of how can I update this model? How can I get data and so on? Um, one more thing that I wanted to talk about is um, that the style of how data scientists develop these models is fairly specific and possibly quite different from how software engineers might develop um, typical applications. This has actually been studied a lot and there, there are a bunch of descriptions here. Like this is a fairly old description. These, I mean, for machine learning terms, fairly old on data science work processes, right? So this is more kind of the scientist's perspective, but you acquire some data, you prepare some data, then you write some analysis scripts, you analyze them, you look at the outputs, and probably you debug and repeat and make better scripts, better models, look at the output again. Then you look at if, if there's something that you like, you take some notes, you talk about the results, you probably go back to explore some uh, alternatives, Sometimes you might actually go back and collect more data. And at some point after a lot of iteration, you might get to a point where you're actually happy with the result and you publish it or um, produce a model that you wanna work. Right? There are lots of versions of this that look kind of similar. Um, this is something that Microsoft published as a, as a draft, maybe a little bit small on this slide, but it again says, uh, there are all these parts, kind of business understanding, data acquisition, modeling, deployment, um, and they all kind of interrelate and you kind of go in circles and it's iterative and it's exploratory and so on. Um, here's also a study that I like um, where uh, it's 2008, so quite a while ago, this was before notebooks, um, where they asked a bunch of students to develop a machine learning model. They gave them, um, four hours to do this. And they recorded accuracy of the model as they went along, right? So what happens is that data scientists tend to build a first model quickly. It may not work particularly well, but then they continue to improve it. And what you see here, um, the Y axis is accuracy and the X axis is time, that over the time of um, two, uh, four hours, for almost every participant, they started with very low accuracy and then they figured something out to make it higher accuracy and then it increases over time. And in a lot of cases it levels off, right? So this is very common that this is a very open-ended and exploratory process where you start with something, you try, you iterate, you try something else until you get to a point that you're happy. This is actually similar to doing research where when you go in, you have an idea that something might work, but you don't know yet it's open-ended, um, you don't know that it's actually possible, right? So it's not just going in and coding a thing that you know will work and you just need to do it and debug it, but you actually don't even know when you're going in whether you be able to build a model like this. Um, so 
So this is an interesting question here of, isn't that somewhat similar to kind of the spiral process model or agile? There we also iterate, right? So in the spiral model, we focus on risk. Um, the idea is you do a big project and you iterate into multiple things, build prototypes, extend those prototypes. And the spiral process typically says, do risk risky parts first, right? Figure out the hardest part of the project, figure out how to do this, show a prototype for this. It's a risk management technique. And Agile is kind of the idea, um, let's not do too many specifications up front, right? Let's work with the customer, let's kind of iterate frequently, let's demonstrate something and kind of work in terms of sprints. Is that the same or is this different from kind of the iterative workflow that you see data science do? Daniel? So for Agile, isn't it that you're trying to deliver work uh, frequently to the customer? Whereas it seems like with model development, you're kind of doing an experiment and internally checking if was that good enough or not. Um, unless you're considering yourself the customer, I'm not sure. Yeah, I'm not sure. For, for Agile, do you deliver a product every sprint cycle? In some cases, yes, but in a lot of cases, it's probably also here's a prototype that you can play with, right? Mm. Um, any other comments, ideas? Is a spiral model or agile processes clear? Uh, right here? Uh, I was just, I just want to build upon Daniel's point. So I think even in sprints, at the end of every sprint, there should be some output that is visible to an end user. Mm -hmm. And uh, in an agile, we have uh, like continuous involvement from the stakeholders in every iteration, right? But on the other hand, the model cycle, which you showed, it, it seems like uh, until we get a final result, which might require a number of iterations, we're not involving the customer. Like the work is not done yet. Right. Um, you might you might publish a model, put something in production that kind of works, and then you continue improving. Right. I think that's that's fairly common as well. So you you deploy your first spam filter, and then you improve the spam filter for future releases. Um, but yeah, it, in an earlier stages before you release something to a customer, probably it's not very visible. Uh, Jake? If we're just talking about building the model and, and um, acknowledging the, the study you showed before where things did improve with time, um, I would think that it would be, I mean, for the model, you're just trying to deliver a set of parameters that constitute the, the model. And I think it might be harder to time box that to estimate how long it would take as well as um, decompose it into smaller modules because you're just trying to extract a model from it. So yeah. I think there would be some challenges trying to apply like an agile model to it because of that. Yeah. So, so I agree. I think this is, this is quite different from what software developers do in an iterative fashion. Right, so it's kind of much more sciencey, much more exploratory. Um, you have a vague idea, but you can't say, let's break it down into sprints, right? Um, you can't really play. I mean, you can say, first I'm trying this feature and this feature and this feature, but it's typically much more kind of creative, exploratory. I try this in short iterations. I try something else. Um, you also don't really know what the most risky part is unless you think the entire model is a risky part and you're just trying to build the first model as part of the larger software project then you can think this is the first spiral right but i think it's way less defined way less structured that you can break things down um, the iterations look quite different i think for a data scientist um, than what you have as a software developer right so it's way more exploratory i think way more driven by intuition rather than kind of planning. 
um, for the most part. This, is, this seems to be what most studies show, how most people are operating. Um, there might be some people that have a more structured approach, but I think this is, a, this is a most common kind of data science approach, is really this exploratory fashion um, working with things. And so it's really this start with the rough goal, kind of iterate, have some heuristics. You really let your experience guide this. This is often why um, experienced data analysts, data scientists are better at building these models because they kind of know what to look for, right? They, there's a lot of try and error, lots of iterative refinement, and often actually going back to collect more data, clean more data, and maybe revise the goals, right? Um, skip this. Uh, has anybody of you done a project like this? Have you experienced um, kind of this iterative fashion where a lot of things were unclear, maybe hard to plan? Anything you might want to share? Or maybe the opposite, maybe this is completely mischaracterizing this from your perspective. Maybe one last story. We're doing a project where we're doing anomaly detection to find um, malicious updates um, of software packages. And again, we have a lot of data. We mined all of NPM and we have a lot of characteristics and can kind of identify things that might look suspicious, maybe in a larger context, but it's really, let's do some anomaly detection here was the starting point, right? Uh, there are some, techniques for learning. We know this should be possible. We run the first version of completely garbage and kind of what it detects. And then we think about what could be better features here and slowly it gets better and maybe um, to a usable version over time, right? So again, very iterative process driven by a big goal, but not by I mean, we talk about kind of what are the next things to try. Those could be sprints, but it's more like, let's try some ideas here. Let's try some features there. It's not a very thing, a thing that you could plan for a long time, really upfront, I think, or prioritize things, at least in my experience. Yeah. Which brings me to notebooks. Um, so just by show of hands, who has used a notebook before? Yes, no, have you used one before? Um, Show of hands works both ways. Um, so I assume I can make this fairly quick, right? So pretty much everybody has um, used notebooks in, in one form or another. There are these things, they actually have a long history. The idea goes back to this idea of literate programming where you treat a program like literature. So you focus much more on the description and then maybe there's some code in between, but the primary artifact is, um, is essentially your text or your narrative that goes back to the, um, to the 80s, to Donald Knut. Um, and then this has been around also for a long time in software. Um, Wolfram Mathematica has done this for a long time. It looks fairly similar to what you see as notebooks before where you have text and code sets that you can execute and play with. Um, and let me just, I think, it's fairly obvious, everybody knows this, right? So you have this, and I, let's ignore this. You have this thing um, that has text cells and then code cells. You can execute these code cells. There's kind of a global runtime. So whatever you execute here changes state. This might be used in the next cell. You can execute them out of order. There are all kinds of things around here, but in the end, you can almost think of this as one long Python file that just has parts and you execute individual parts of this file, right? Um, the idea that people always talk about as kind of the, the important innovation here is that you have text in between, right? That you have a lot of documentation. In practice, that's not used a lot. So studies generally show um, there are some things that people want to share, but people often explore things and then add text at the end when they want to share something. Um, most of the time they just play with cells or very minimal documentation. Um, let's just briefly start with a um, discussion here. Why do you think notebooks are so popular? Why are people using them? Or the other way around, what are some of the problems that you've seen with notebooks? Why maybe people shouldn't be using them? Do you have an opinion either way?
Leo? Uh, so I've recently used it a lot for my current research project. Um, I think the good point of a notebook, it's, uh, it's very convenient. You can just uh, make comments visible and uh, running codes all at the same time. Um, and also it's easy to pass it along to someone else uh, who may be sharing the project with you. And the problem with, uh, with that is if you want to have a huge uh, uh, project making a an actual software, then the, the code you have in the notebook, um, it takes a longer time to convert and integrate them into a larger part of a software system. Mm -hmm. Yep, there are a couple of things in there. It's, it's easy to experiment. It has a visualization right there. It's easy to share the result, right? People don't need to execute them. Um, again, um, it might be harder to convert this into something that you want to use eventually. Right, uh, Chris? Yeah, so um, I think like, uh, you know, the purpose for them, like they're really good for, you know, communicating results um, and that sort of thing. But um, I think that also relies on like the code inside as well being uh, like in a readable format um, mm -hmm. and sort of, um, you know, refactored to have like the higher level uh, logic, um, you know, visible. Um, yep. So, but yeah, I think overall it's a, a really convenient sort of tool to use. Yep. Daniel says super easy print debugging. I'm not sure whether that's a positive or a negative. Um, I mean, a negative is potentially that there is no better debugger. Um, in most cases, right? But the positive is also it's fairly easy to do this um, and run segments of code at a time, um, right? Jerkwee? Yeah, I think uh, the notebook is pr pretty good for uh, Python or any scriptified language, but it's not good for like C or C++ where you need a compiler to compile everything at once, right? So yeah. it's only practical for uh, scripting language like Python. I think it has been used in Scala as well, but I think you compile the segments in, uh, sequentially or interpret the Scala code. I'm not entirely sure. Um, so here, uh, here are a couple of things that I have. Um, so I think one of one of the things that you also said is you get quick feedback, right? So it's like the um, a wrapper loop where you, on the command line, you write something, you can see the output immediately, right? Um, the, this is this is nice. You can experiment with this, and in contrast to this wrapper loop or uh, this command line where you just call Python and then type immediately, you have a history of what you've done, right? So um, you don't tend to execute individual lines, but maybe two or three lines at a time. But it's fairly common to have these um, these blocks. Um, sharing visual feedback, actually having tables in there is nice compared to kind of a standard IDE where the output shows up where somewhere in the, in the line below. And I think one of the biggest advantages is incremental computation. This is something that you might not see that easily, but you load data once. Um, so I can again show this in this notebook here. Oops. Uh, this one where you load data. If it's a lot of data, it's loaded once. You clean the data maybe in some uh, steps. And then if I want to train the model or if I want to make any changes to the training or to the feature things, I only execute those cells down here. Right? So I, I may modify how the name feature works or the sex feature or whatever, right? Kind of, this is Titanic data set. Um, but uh, you, you're extracting some information and you're not rerunning the entire notebook, right? Not the entire code. You're just rerunning this one cell. And it changes the state or it remembers the state from before and updates the state for future cells. This is actually something that's quite convenient in a lot of ways. Um, there are some problems if you execute code out of order. This is actually a quite well-known problem that you can get in a really messy state. Worst case, you need to re-execute from front. Uh, from front to back, right? But it's it's one of the, the big advantages is this kind of incremental computation thing um, in contrast to having a script, a Python script that you always add something to and you run it again and again and again, right? So what I've showed you uh, last week with the um, learning thing, I always executed the entire program in Scala, 
right? So it was loading the data every time, even though I made only small changes to what I wanted to execute. Right, and that's really just easy. You can do a lot of copy paste, no abstraction needed, right? You don't need to learn about functions really or about proper abstractions and easy to share. But it also has a bunch of disadvantages. Um, so a lot of people, there's a lot of negative comments also about notebooks, especially from software engineers who say lots of bad software engineering practices. Um, anything that comes to mind, anything that you have seen people complain about or that you felt yourself, this is kind of bad practices, what's happening here? Version control is hard to do. Um, it's kind of stored in this XML or JSON binary format. Uh, so even if just the output changes a little bit, it's kind of uh, makes versioning and looking at differences hard. Little modularity, yeah, possibly hard to read. Uh, hopefully there's some documentation, but usually there isn't, right? So you have a lot of cells and it's, it's essentially like one very long method, right? This is some, something we would typically call a code smell. It's different cells, but it's uh, one long method. It's all global state, right? So there's no scoping of variables typically that you would do with methods or so on. You, whenever a cell reads some data, it writes it to a different variable, um, all global variables pretty much. Um, yeah, not conductive to test coverage. Nobody tests the code in notebooks really. I mean, you can, but it's not common. Um, and yeah, collaboration um, with one file kind of, typically we have imports and modules and import them to make collaboration easier right here where we have one file. Um, and then things like Colab may help us to have multiple people edit the same file at the same time, but it's not the traditional way. Um, yeah, and there's lots of comments that people follow bad programming styles like poor naming conventions or things like this. Um, and potentially hard to debug, yes. Um, we should be a little bit careful. And again, this is something that we'll probably discuss more later. Um, it's very easy for a software engineer kind of to say, oh, we write well-structured modularized code and write test cases all the time. And those data scientists, they, oh, they need to learn, but they will come around eventually, right? So it's just this playground and notebook. Um, there's a point why they do this, right? There's a point that um, test coverage may not work while you're doing exploratory uh, work, right? So maybe the best naming conventions don't matter that much while it's all just exploratory. Um, so I think if you understand the mindset of a data scientist who kind of explores the world, um, a lot of this makes much more sense than if you have the mindset of somebody who wants to maintain the software for a long time. It's actually very common and has been studied as well that the way that most people use notebooks is in phases where they, they explore things, they write things, they move things around, copy paste, actually lots of cells comment out stuff, and then they clean things up. They remove cells, they write some documentation and then they explore again and then they clean things up and they explore again and clean things up, right? This seems to be a much more common WordPress uh, and I think it's, it seems to be much more important to be kind of flexible and do something quickly rather than to write long-term code. I think if you want long-term maintainable code, you probably want to go outside of the notebook at some point um, or have, have some suitable infrastructure. All right, any questions on kind of this iterative process or notebooks or anything like this? All right, Jake. Is there um, anyone particularly working on, on some kind of um, technology or, or something to do graceful migration from notebooks to a more mature environment? Um, or is it just kind of uh, informal? Um, we're actually doing some research on this this summer. Um, so this is a project that we're doing, Shuri is here as well. Um, uh, there, there are some tools to extract Python code from notebooks, um, NB convert and things like this. Um, they are used sometimes with ad hoc pipelines and things like this. 
Um, and there is a lot of work on helping people to clean up notebooks, like program slicing for notebook code. There's a cool Microsoft project. And they're building in some of this in their, in their kind of internal environment. Um, I don't, this is often one of the big pain points that's mentioned by practitioners, kind of converting, kind of going from a notebook into production. And we'll talk about this a little bit later more. Um, all right, I'm behind and I think I'm not going to finish today either with what I had planned for this lecture, but I wanna talk a little bit more background about um, machine learning and artificial intelligence a little bit more broadly. And I wanna give you at least an intuition for deep learning today. I'm not going to go into quite as much depth as I did last time, uh, but I want, to get you, want you to get an intuition of why it has this reputation for it training takes forever or the models are massive and what it's maybe good at, what it's not so good at, okay. So maybe just broadly in terms of terminology, this is a fairly commonly shown figure. Um, terminology is not used super consistently, but we typically say that artificial intelligence is a broad field of humans uh, computers acting humanly or thinking humanly or thinking rationally or acting rationally. Um, if you want to be very broad, some people just say artificial intelligent is whatever is hard in computer science. Um, so you can frame this extremely broadly, right? So this is all kinds of reasoning about uh, sensing, robotics and so on can be, uh, a lot of this can be framed under in artificial intelligence. And if you look at a kind of how people use the term, it's also super broad. Machine learning technically is a sub-discipline that uses data in some form um, or some observations to do something. In the most common form, it's something like supervised learning that we looked at, right, where you have some data, some labels, and you learn a function. And then deep learning inside, just like decision trees, is one specific uh, technique um, that's super popular these days. Right. Um, the terms are often used in overlapping ways, um, but um, if you want to be precise, I think this is, this is the most common definition. Um, in this course, we're talking mostly about machine learning, but I want to give you a sense of how, how this can be brought more broadly. Right? So artificial intelligence um, has, can be defined in many different ways, but there's things like acting humanly, like try to behave like a human, solving the Turing test, right? Um, doing natural language processing, interacting with the real world, lots of uh, vision robotics, may use machine learning there. There's also thinking humanly, like thinking like humans, like cognitive science, but there's also the rational side where you wanna think about uh, rationally, reason about lots of things rationally. This is often logic, patterns, structures, and then acting rationally. This is where you think about agents, maybe solving computer games, uh, things like this. And artificial intelligence includes a lot of different things. Problem solving, um, which includes things like Boolean satisfiability solvers and logic, um, but reasoning logic as well, um, learning, this where most of the machine learning work is, and then a lot of kind of perception, acting, communication, and so on. Um, let me, yeah, let me do this quickly. Um, in the machine learning field, um, it's also important to distinguish different kinds of problems that we're solving, uh, because this will affect a lot on how you're evaluating this and which techniques are suitable. The most common machine learning problems, if you think of kind of supervised learning, are classification problems and regression problems. Classification problems is if you have a finite set of outputs, right, yes or no, or um, you're recognizing uh, one of five things in a, in a picture, things like this, right, where you have a limited set of outputs and you're saying which one of this is it. And regression are those things where we're predicting a number, like the, the price of a house, right? Um, there are alternatives here. This was also in the reading, right? Uh, probability estimation is telling you what's the chance of something will be in a certain class or will be a certain number. This is often used underneath classification problem. And then you just report the thing with the highest probability. 
right? Something like there's 80% chance that there might be cancer in the picture. So you say the classification, yes or no, yes, there's cancer. And then ranking problems are things where you return things in order. Um, and you might do things like um, use a regression mechanism to give you a score and then report the things with the highest score in order, right? Um, and a lot of hybrid approaches. So let's just go quickly through this and let me just, I've never tried to use this poll, uh, poll feature for Zoom, but I wanna do this now. Um, so if you, let's say we're doing this, uh, detecting a shoe brand in an image, right? So you have an app where you can take a picture of a shoe and it tells you this is a Nike shoe or an Adidas shoe. What kind of problem is this? Can you just vote whether it's classification, probability estimation, regression, ranking, um, or something else? Is it just Nike and Adidas shoes? Uh, maybe more. It doesn't. It's still going to be a finite set, so um, I can show show you the results. Right. So everybody said classification. Um, so if you have a finite set. I think it's kind of hard to say, assign numbers to things, right? So it's always a set of producers that you're trying to predict. Uh, you might do this as probability estimations and turn this into a classification problem. But what you're really concerned about as the output is, um, yeah, classification, what kind of true, right? Uh, can you see the results, by the way, on my screen? I'm not entirely sure what's. Um, yes. All right. So. Um, let's do this again for the um, next thing, recommending videos on YouTube. What kind of problem is this? All right, let me show you the results. Um, so you're giving a list of recommendations typically ranked by the highest one, right? So you can think of this as classification, yes or no, let's do something. Maybe as probability estimation, is this a good or a bad recommendation? And then you take the highest ranked ones. In the end, you tend to solve a ranking problem, right? You may use one of the other techniques, maybe combine them in a specific way. Um, understanding the survival rate of um, Titanic passages. So let's say you have the data set of who survived and who didn't, and you have some information about them, like their gender, um, their, um, their, um, their class of service, uh, things like this. What kind of problem are you solving here? All right, I think I can, stop here, uh, pretty much every says probability estimation. Um, I, I would think of this more classically as, um, as a classification problem. Did somebody die, yes or no? And then we try to understand the model in how do we figure out whether somebody dies or not, right? So the typical approach to do this is build a classification tree, uh, a decision tree, for example, yes or no, and see what's in the decisions. Right, or build a linear regression model and see which features are actually relevant. Um, let's see. Um, estimating the arrival time of a ride-sharing car. Yeah, everybody agrees it's a regression problem. Um, you're predicting a time, a number. And then I, I wanna do the transcription as a last thing. And I think this is very non-obvious. Maybe somebody here has natural language processing experience. If you have no idea, take a guess. Okay. Somebody here who knows how natural language processing works and what kind of technique is used there? I had to ask myself, but um, my understanding, it depends a little bit on how you're encoding this, uh, but my understanding is that most of the time you're predicting what is the next word in a sentence. So you're predicting one word at a time, and each time you do a classification problem. 
you have a large number of words and say, what's the next word? And then you do the next word and the next word and the next word, right? So the, the classification problem of what's the next word depending on the previous words and the audio file or something like this. Um, and there are kind of hybrid approaches and lots of other things. Um, uh, and there's probably some ranking in between. But I hope you get a sense of that there are different kind of problems here and that different kind of methods are appropriate. Vivek? Uh, yeah, I wanted to ask like, uh, since we are trans transcribing an audio file, so this it has to do something with the signal, right? Yep. Ultimately, so like I I'm not really sure. Like, are there ways to like what are the ways to encode a signal? So um, we come back to this as deep learning. This is typically these days people use deep learning for this and pretty much take the raw input. Um, you could learn almost from the uncompressed audio file where you just have a sequence of bytes of um, where it is, I think. There's probably some pre-processing that you can do, but I'm not an expert in this area. Um, I can actually check um, how this is done. Um, all right. The other thing is that there's a distinction in machine learning into uh, supervised learning and unsupervised learning. Uh, Mahin, do you have a question? Yeah, I just wanted to ask, uh, similarly, could you mention how image analysis works, um, especially I, detecting objects within an image? I'll show you an example later. Sure. Okay. Um, all right. There's a, one more important distinction um, that's supervised learning, unsupervised learning, and maybe reinforcement learning. Um, the idea is essentially whether you have labeled data or unlabeled data. Does anybody, can, we, can somebody give me an, an example of something that you can learn without labeled data? What would an unsupervised learning approach do where you just have data but no labels? Clustering, right? So, so um, uh, Go and chess would be um, would be reinforcement learning. Typically, um, common examples are clustering, figuring out what data is similar to other data. Anomaly detection is another one. So, we've seen a lot of data, and now if if I see new data that's different from the past data, then I'm sounding an alarm. Um, uh -huh. So. I don't want to go through this, but um, identifying whether a scan show, uh, shows, a picture shows cancer in an image that's typically using supervised learning. You just feed a lot of training data which show cancer or not, and it's learning patterns from this. Playing chess is reinforcement learning typically where a computer plays itself and learns from reactions um, of the world, right? So it kind of, um, it doesn't have direct labels saying this is a good move or a bad move, but it can observe the environment and see, oh yeah, the move eventually led to a good result. Predicting sales of a price of a house would typically be supervised learning. Organizing books into topics, that's something that you can do with unsupervised learning, right? So you can do this with supervised learning where you show a few examples of books and labels, and then you learn more of this, or you can just figure out here are all the books structure them in a way that all the similar books are together. And then I can look at the pile of books in one corner and say, oh yeah, this seems to be science fiction or something like this. Right? Um, detecting shoe brands in an image would be supervised learning, identifying unusual purchases as anomaly detection, could be supervised or unsupervised learning, um, often unsupervised learning. Uh, learning to walk is often one of the reinforcement uh, examples where you run this in a simulation. Transcribing an audio file, probably supervised learning, where you give a lot of examples. Um, and now on top of this, there are tons of different techniques um, to use this. They are inspired by very different approaches. Um, I've only talked about decision trees and I will show you deep networks, uh, deep neural networks, um, but there are many different approaches, genetic programming, Markov chains, nearest neighbors, um, that use different underlying techniques. I don't wanna go into this, but if you're interested in kind of the basic directions where big groups of researchers are going, I can recommend this book, The Master Algorithm, which is really written for a non-technical audience. 
So if you've already taken a machine learning course, this is probably boring and way too high level. But if that's, I think that gives you a level of, a high level understanding of how different approaches work, how genetic algorithms work and things like this. Um, they can hold a conversation um, and kind of have an overview of the techniques. Um, so that's fairly readable. Um, it's, it's written in a completely math-free, high-level thing toward actually non-CS people that just want to learn about machine learning. All right. I'm picking this one more technique, neural networks, and I'm trying to go a little bit deeper again to give you an idea of how they work. If you've taken introduction to machine learning, you probably know this, I apologize, uh, but for everybody else, if you just applied them or so, I think it helps to understand a little bit how they work. Um, the whole concept is inspired by biology, by studying how the human brain or animal brains work in general, where you have um, uh, neurons are the nodes essentially, and then you have connections between nodes and these connections kind of grow or develop over time. And you have electricity that kind of ac activates these synapses and then activates neurons. And we have millions of those and somehow it works that we can process audio, that we can see the world, things like this, make decisions, right? Reason. Um, so there's a lot of study behind of how this might work as at the cell level. And people have studied artificial neural networks for a very, very long time. So this goes way back, I think, 30s or 20s, and it has been popular and studied a lot in the 70s and 60s. Um, there was kind of a disappointment for a while with what people can do with this. And then there was this new uh, wave of kind of neural network and excitement uh, in the last, I don't know, 10, 20 years uh, where we had the hardware and the data to actually scale this and make this feasible at, at a massive scale and a bunch of inventions along the way. The idea below is relatively simple um, and there are a bunch of variations. So essentially you, you model neurons that are nodes in your brain or in this artificial sense that are on or off, right? One or zero, or maybe have a number in between. And you have connections between them that send information from one to another. So if one is activated, it sends kind of electricity information to the next node and it influences how the next thing is activated, right? So you kind of can think of this as um, electricity flowing through your brain, going on and off and activating and deactivating a bunch of neurons at a time. The original ideas of where people played with this is um, think of each neuron as a bit that's either on or off. And then each connection between neurons is also either on or off based on the previous neuron. And the origin, one of the early rules was that you activate a neuron always if at least M inputs are active, right? So in this example here, let's say if at least two inputs are active, then if this is active, there are two edges here, so two inputs are active here as well. And if this is inactive, this will not be inactive, right? So this is just propagating information from one node to the next. Make sense? This thing here says that both X and Y need to be activated because we need two incoming edges. Do you have an idea or have seen this in class? How would you do this with an OR? So we want whenever X or Y is activated, then O should be activated. So we need two incoming edges uh, to be activated when X is activated, two incoming edges activated if Y is activated. If neither is activated, no incoming edge should be activated. Any idea? No, we don't need an intermediate node, right? Um, Kevin is right, we need two nodes. Let me see whether that works, uh, two edges, right? So this means if X is activated, then O is activated. We need two edges here. 
which means if Y is activated, O is activated. Right, and if both are activated, we have more incoming edges. We only need two, so that's fine. The people got pretty excited initially that they can model logic, uh, not as a bit hard or XOR was a bit hard, but they figured it out eventually. And they kind of, if you have the structure, you can design things that are do more complicated things and you can approximate a lot of functions. Right? kind of people figured out that you can do all kinds of things if you just structure these in the, in the right way because you can do uh, logic essentially. Um, so these annotations stay, that's not good. Um, all right. Um, this has been pushed much further, of course. Um, one of the next steps was to think of each function not only as on and off, but as having a number and each, each um, connection also having a weight. So the idea here is that you have two, in this case, two inputs and three neurons. Each input goes to each neuron and there's a weight. So if we want to know the value of this node here, we compute the weight of this edge times the activation value of this node plus the weight of this edge times the activation value of this node. And so this is what you see here. Weight one times X one plus weight two times X two. That gives you a value. And then you combine this with a step function or any other sort of function where you essentially just say, if the combined weighted sum is negative, then this is zero, otherwise this is one. Does this make sense so far? So the, the idea is um, each of these nodes is either one or zero in the end, depending on whether the weighted sum of the incoming edges where you have different weights um, is larger than zero or not. And you can adjust those weights in many different ways. And these weights is actually what we later want to learn, right? We don't want to manually specify them, um, but it's saying, for example, the first weight could be minus five and the second weight could be plus 0.5 or so. And then we see that if the second thing is activated and the first thing is not, or it's within a certain range, um, then we get an activation value that says this is a correct output or this is a correct output, right? So in general, so what we have is these for three nodes, we have these three different functions where we just say some base value plus the weighted input of X1 plus the weighted input of X2. We do this for all three things. In each case, we apply the step function at the end. The number of LTU nodes, um, it depends on the architecture of the network. Yes, we come there. Um, so the way that this is typically done is via matrix multiplications. Um, so if you have all these weights here, like in this simple example, six weights, I can put them into a two by three matrix and compute them by X, like the vector X here, the uh, values of X1, X2, and then add a vector B for all the minimum values. Then I get a vector of all the results of the ATUs in this row. And then I apply the step function to every single row in this vector, right? Or every single value. Make sense so far? Uh, and then we get to more layers. This is also where kind of deep networks come from that we have more layers uh, where we have a bunch of things here that have this format, right? They take the inputs from the previous layers with some weights, apply a step function at the end. And then we do the same thing with the output of these layers. Again, apply some weights, see whether these are activated and get some output, right? So in this case, what this would turn down to, let me see, this is a description here. So we have the first layer where we say for, for layer, I don't know why it's called H. Oh, the hidden layer. This is the inner, inner layer. Uh, we have the weights of the hidden layer times X plus the base values. We apply the step function. That means these are the outputs of this hidden layer, right? We um, 
I think I have, I'm missing apprentices, but otherwise, yeah. The, I'm applying from the output layer, I'm applying the weights to the results that I got from the first layer, uh, from the hidden layer, and apply the, um, at the base value here. That's the input from one. And then I apply the step function again. Make sense? So what you see here is now that we have a lot of weights, the W values and the B values. And those are the things that we essentially want to learn in the end. If we have the suitable weights for this, we get some input, we put some inputs and we get the right output. That's basically the idea. And the way that learning works is um, just in a nutshell, you take some data with some, some labeled data. You start with completely random weights for all Ws and all Bs. You put in some data point and you observe the outcome, right? So you just compute every activation in the network for, for specific values, like for a specific X here, you see the activations of all nodes at the output layer. And then you see whether that's the right output. If it's a wrong output, you essentially change all weights a little bit. You change the weights of the output layer a little bit uh, to make it more likely to get the right output. Then you change the weights in the hidden layer a little bit in the right direction and so on. There's a bunch of math behind that you can do these small changes to all the weights because you can observe the gradient. You can see if I want to get from zero to one for this node here, for example, because that's the correct output, then all these inputs here have currently negative weights. So I need to kind of tone this down or this has a positive weight. So I need to uh, increase this or so, right? So you can always figure out in which direction do I need to change the weights to make this single example a little bit better. So, you have this iterative process where you initialize all weights with random values, you compute a prediction, and if it's not the expected prediction, then you go back and you change all weights a little bit toward this prediction. And you just continue this over and over again with training data, each time adjusting all the weights a little bit, and you hope that over time you get fairly stable results, that the weights don't change back and forth a little bit, that you actually get a lot of good predictions and not that many wrong predictions. And that works surprisingly well if you have enough data. Um, there is not that much more to it. Um, I mean, technically, yes, and you kind of need pretty big distributed systems to actually make this work in practice. But the basic ideas are really just that you have these nodes that take a bunch of inputs, weigh them together, make a decision, yes or no, put them out to the next layer, possibly to the next layer and so on. And then when you train things, you just try some random, you try some training data. If it's correct, great. If it's incorrect, you tweak the weights a little bit. And so the tr training algorithm is really incremental. You could stop at any point. And you can also take a model and train it further by giving more data, maybe tweaking dates, uh, data into a different direction. Um, technically, the step function will look different. There are reasons in the math behind this that you can't use the one or zero step function. So typically what people are using is the logistic function. Don't ask me to explain why the specific function. It's a function that just kind of is used to, to kind of normalize data between one and uh, minus one, I think. Or you use the uh, um, RELU function, also has a name and I don't remember why, uh, which is just cutting off all negative results, right? So um, both of these functions make the math behind this work that you can actually uh, run this. And deep learning is essentially what I've just shown you. It's just in practice using more than more than the f five nodes that I've shown you, right? So a bunch of nodes, bunch of layers, um, and there are a bunch of innovations, what the layers can do and can't do. So just briefly on terminology, what I've shown you is in general neural networks and deep neural networks are just neural networks. There's nothing specific except that we call them deep when we want to get money from uh, startup funding companies, right? Because it's kind of hip as a term or we call them deep just because they have a lot of hidden layers. 
right? But it's, people just call these things kind of deep learning, deep neural networks. Um, the architecture of a network is typically decided before you learn, and that's the layout and the number of parameters. So in this specific example, we have an architecture of two layers, one or three layers, one input layer, one hidden layer, and one output layer. And we decided that the hidden layer has three nodes, the output layer has two nodes, and that they are all connected. That's one architecture. That's an architecture with three layers, where the middle node has three layers, uh, three, uh, the middle layer has three nodes, the output layer. We could decide on something else. We could decide on an architecture where we still have three layers, but we have 500 nodes in the middle layer and five output nodes. Or we could decide on an architecture where we have 20 layers, each with five nodes or each with 20 nodes. Which architecture to choose depends a lot of, on experience. This is where a lot of research is, what architecture works for what kind of problems. Um, and that's something where I can completely not help you with. Um, right? So there's typically for certain classes of problems, there's like state of the art architectures that people are using. Um, the architecture of the network, that's kind of the hyperparameters, right? So that's this deciding how the model looks like, how the learning approach is done. It's a network structure, how many layers, what connection, and also what kind of step function you're using, all right? The model parameters are all the weights that we're learning. So again, um, in this thing, every edge in this graph has a weight, right? Each weight is a parameter of the model or constant in the final model. But if you stick to the terminology here, right, we have parameters, those are the things that we're learning in the model. And we have hyperparameters that control how the model looks like that is not determined why we're learning this from data. Make sense so far? Let me show you one example. This is kind of the hello world example of neural networks or deep neural networks. It's, um, no, I think it's actually the second example. The hello world example is uh, handwriting digit recognition. Um, this is an example with a bunch of fashion items where we identify 10 kinds of objects in training data. So there's 70,000 small grayscale images and we they are already labeled. This is data that we can download and we want to identify is this a bag, is this a coat, is this, are these trousers and so on. And we hope that a neural network can somehow detect this, right? So if we want to learn this, we need to specify the model architecture. This is no longer a single line learn function as you would do with a um, SVM or with a, um, a decision tree, but you actually need to write some code to describe what the model architecture is. In Keras, for example, it might look something like this, where you say you have, in this example, we're creating three layers. Um, we're starting with the input layer, which doesn't learn anything, right? Where we just say we have 28 by 28 pixels, each with a byte to determine the grayscale. So we have um, 784 input nodes. So if you think back of my graph where I have two inputs, here we have 780 inputs, right? The first row is already very long. And then we have three layers. The first layer has 300 nodes. It uses this RELU activation function or um, step function. Right, it's just saying that we have these 300 nodes. So from every of the 700 inputs, we have one edge to each of the 300 nodes here. Then we have another layer that has 100 nodes. So from each edge of the first, uh, of the first layer, we have an edge to the second layer. These are two hidden layers. And then we have 10 output nodes. So these 10 output nodes correspond to the 10 classes that we want to represent. And the way that this is typically done, this is called softmax. This is just reporting of these 10 nodes, only a single one will be active. And that's the one that has the highest activation, right? So if we're going back to this graph here, we have 784 input nodes. We have 300 nodes in the first layer 
Then we have an extra layer in between with 100 nodes, and then an extra layer or output layer with 10 nodes. And then we have 70,000 data sets to train the model on. Um, I don't have the code to train the model, um, but it's essentially, this is again then one or two lines uh, that just says, once you have this model with its architecture, fit this output and the rest uh, is done by a framework, right? It figures out, it uh, does a forward activation, sees whether it's the right output, adjusts the nodes and so on over time. So can you compute how many parameters you have in this model? Like how big is this model? How many weights are we learning? How would you compute this? So for the first layer, we have 784 inputs. And from each of them, we have a connection to these 400, uh, 300 next nodes in the next layer. Right, so we have 784 times 300 nodes in the first, just from the first to the next connection, plus another 300 because we always need to connect the one to each, right? So we have this B, B parameter. Um, and then from, th from 300 nodes to 100 nodes on the next layer, um, and then from 100 to 10 on the next layer. So what Daniel writes is roughly correct, except that he's missing the B nodes, right? So this is the number of the W uh, parameters, and then we have a number of B parameters. So this is, this is what he's writing there, right? So first layer this plus 300 for the ones, next layer is 300 plus 10 plus 100 for the ones, and then uh, 100 times 10. So this single model has a quarter of a million parameters that we're learning, right? Compare this to decision trees that we discussed last week where we had maybe 10 decisions that we would model, right? If we have deep trees, maybe 20, 100 decisions, maybe a thousand, this has a quarter of a million decisions, right? Or things that we're learning. If you assume a float data type here, right? So 16 uh, bits per value, you would assume that the, storing this model alone, just storing the parameters, you need one megabyte just to store the raw data of all the weights. Also, if you want to compute whether a certain input image produces an output, you take the 784 bytes of the input image, multiply this by this first matrix with nearly a quarter million parameters, right? So you take this long vector of 784 um, numbers, multiply this by this massive matrix, get this new vector of 300 values, apply the, um, apply the step function, apply this again by, multiply this again by a new ve uh, matrix that has 30,000 nodes, get a new vector with 100 values, step function, and multiply this again. This is maybe where you can see why um, the GPUs are quite useful, because you're doing a ton of these matrix multiplications on float or double values, right? So you're doing a lot of these computations in parallel. You don't want to write this as a nested for loop to do the matrix multiplication. You actually want to do a lot of matrix multiplication very efficiently, right? And Every time you go through this network, you're learning the activation of these, um, what is 400, 410 neurons by multiplying all these edges, all these weights every time, and then you go backward. And this is actually a tiny neural network. So just to give you a sense of the size, I gave you two, I, I, looked up two recent networks. Um, so something that's done to classify only slightly larger images, the still kind of weird task, kind of small images, classifying them into a thousand categories. They're using 26 million weights. And each time you go through the network, you activate 
16 million activations. You need 170 megabytes just to store the raw data of the final model. Right? And here's a text generation network um, that was in the news uh, last year because it can create fake news articles, essentially. It can generate things that look like speech. It can imitate how people speak and generate realistic text. This is something that has um, 48 layers, 1.5 billion weights, and just storing the weights takes about 12 gigabytes, right? If you just look at the data here. Um, you can reduce it. So a lot of these things, the neurons, there are techniques to figure out which are not less important. So you can compress the network to a smaller network once you've learned it. But the things that they are sharing are still massive and they trained it on 40 gigabytes of internet text um, over one month on a bunch of GPUs, right? So these are massive models that have been trained. They have just millions or 8 million text uh, web pages where they took every single sentence, I think, as a training data, applied this, computed this backward and forward um, over these um, 1.5 billion weights. So I think, I hope what you get out of this is a feeling why this is expensive, right? Why deep learning may take a long time, why deep neural networks may be fairly big files Right? And even the inference time, even if you have this big model and you want to get the next prediction, it may take some time or some computing resources to compute this because you need to do a lot of these matrix multiplications. It typically doesn't take seconds to do this, right? It's a few milliseconds. We're pretty good at matrix multiplications, but still, if you do, it's way slower than just evaluating a decision tree. Um, and if you want to do this millions of times, this can add up, this can become quite expensive. So typically, just one last slide on, on architectures. Um, there's a lot of different architectures and typically you don't want to connect every node in every layer to every other node. There are lots of tricks to um, kind of jump over layers or um, do things like where a neuron is not connected to all inputs, but only to a subset of the inputs. So this is a common thing where this neuron over here might only look at a bunch of inputs here. And the idea is that these neurons will naturally learn some structure of the picture, right? So that will, this neuron will recognize, oh, there's a hand. And then a later neuron will recognize if there's a hand and there's a head, then it's a robot, something like this. We have no idea typically what's happening inside, right? So just as we don't understand how human brains really work, what each individual neuron is doing or each synapsis is doing, What's happening if we learn this, we get this huge matrix and it somehow works, right? We learn something that becomes stable, that works, but we typically cannot understand why is one of these 1.2 billion weights this value and not a different value, right? Um, it's very hard to understand what the network does other than observing it from the outside. So I think this is probably a good point to wrap up um, for today. Um, so for deep learning, what you can, what I hope you can take away from this is that you can approximate arbitrary functions. So technically it's able to do essentially anything. We don't really understand at this massive scale what it really does. But what it can do, what it's good at, it's, it can handle many input values at the same time. So if you have an, it's fine to have millions of inputs in your input layer. This is why we can handle images, for example. Every single pixel is just an image. We don't need to extract features first. Also audio files, uh, you just take the, the curve or whatever characteristics you, uh, you have of your audio pretty much in raw format and put it in there and then hope that the network figures out internally somehow how to interpret this. And for some reason, this seems to work, right? This seems to work for humans that we can figure out how to see and how to speak and how to listen, right? And this seems to work um, by kind of biology inspired natural uh, uh, artificial networks as well. So the idea is that internal layers may automatically recognize some higher order, uh, higher level structures, and you can help networks by enforcing certain architectures, certain styles, like the idea in a, in a um, 
convolutional network is that you have fewer and fewer um, neurons per layer over time that it kind of forces you to compress things into fewer things that you want to understand. Um, there's typically no explicit feature engineering. You just dump in the raw data and it works well for tasks where this is appropriate. You often get very good results with much simpler techniques if you do some feature engineering. Um, so it doesn't, you can learn pretty much anything with a deep neural network, but finding the right parameters, training this requires a lot of data and a lot of effort, right? So you often need large training sets and it's very hard to understand what it has actually learned. All right. I have more stuff to talk about symbolic API, but I'm running out of time. So I'm going to do this next time. Um, and I probably keep this brief. Um, I think I'm gonna just, um, let me just briefly summarize. So AI is all these different things. I've talked about machine learning and I try to give you an intuition behind deep learning. And I think you should take away what architecture means in this context, what the parameters are, and why this is so massive and so expensive. I don't think the actual mechanism internally matters too much for most of you, right? Um, we will look in, in recitation at some point of how to actually train this with the tool, um, but this is roughly um, where I am. So I'm gonna stop the recording here and then uh, take questions afterward. Um, yeah, uh, tomorrow we're having the recitation uh, on scikit-learn. So uh, I think we encourage everyone to come. If you're very familiar with machine learning and building machine learning models, then I guess you can skip it. But uh, I think it's going to be interesting. We're going to teach you cross validation and uh, just using models from scikit-learn and different techniques. Things like that. So I should probably also say um, we're releasing a new homework assignment tonight, which is um, for two weeks, uh, which is more or less a relatively straightforward machine learning task, except that you need to figure out how to collect the data, how to clean the data and so on. So um, you will probably want to use scikit-learn and notebooks. Um, so if you already know this, great, skip tomorrow's recitation. If some help is useful, some questions, tomorrow's recitation might be a good idea.